going on, Only Playbook fans? We're back for another episode, week 13 preview. Every episode that we record, I get sadder and sadder because that number just keeps going up and up, which means the season is winding down and down. So it's like a weird like happiness, but also really sad, if that makes sense. We're no, about I to reach can't. episode 100 at some point in the next Dude, month. Nine more episodes. We should do something special for that. I'm glad you brought that up. Episode yeah. 100? Does it feel mm-hmm. like it's been that many episodes? <laughs> It no. just seems natural now. I'm just like, you know, this is great. Like, yeah. I get I get to talk about football. I get to do research on football. Like, I'm like, I wish yeah. this was my number one job. Yeah, and the good thing is, uh, I get doesn't listen to any of these, so it's just like for me, it's just like a really nice escape. You know, it's like even if this never transpires into anything, I'm like, I have to record the podcast, babe. It's like very important. It's like, yeah, follow. <laughs> Dang follow it, I was going to tell you to follow, go pick up some avocados. <laughs> like she's like, follow your dreams, and then I'm like, what's up, dudes? So like we're just like talking shit about football. So yeah, it's yeah. it's a win 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 in that aspect for sure, for sure. Uh, again, a lot to unpack. Week 13 for us, two more this week and next week, and then playoffs begin. Uh, trade deadline for us is tomorrow. I think a lot of other leagues' trade deadlines already passed, so yeah. uh, hopefully your rosters are solidified. But uh, a little bit of things to talk about before we jump into previewing the action. Let's kick it off with water for the top. It is Thursday that we're recording before Thursday night football has even happened. So injuries just makes no sense to really talk about them today. We will, uh, we'll tweet out injury, uh, updates tomorrow. Follow only tw- only playbook on Twitter, uh, and turn your notifications on. So you don't miss any of the injuries heading into Sunday. Uh, I just thought it'd be an interesting time for us guys to go through our matchups. Uh, I know you guys are, you know, vying for that final playoff spot. Um, so I know you guys probably have some matchups that you want to talk through and I can be the neutral, you know, middleman. Cause I know you probably don't want to ask show it to show like, who should I start? He's going to try to like, fuck you. Sabotage like, yeah, dude. Yeah. He's sabotage <laughs> and vice versa. So I can be the kind of happy medium. That's like, all right guys. All right, let's be real. So, um, if you guys have any, cause they take precedence. Cause in our league, you guys are fighting for more than what I am. Uh, you guys kick it off. Otherwise I have some that I do want to talk about. Just Go, for ahead. Consolation. Go ahead. Okay. So for me real quick quarterback. I, I've been Tua, but he's got a really tough matchup this week against the 49ers, 49ers which right. we'll talk about that. And Trevor Lawrence is who I picked up, and he's playing against Detroit. Now, mm-hmm. you know, Trevor Lawrence, two straight weeks, 20-plus fantasy points. He looked really good last week, so it wasn't just like bullshit fantasy points. And it's the easiest matchup that you could have in football this week. So I don't know. Where do you lean? Because, again, would it surprise you if Trevor Lawrence somehow dropped like four because his worst game of the year was against the Houston Texans? So, you know, there that can happen. So there is that side to it. Um, who do you? Where do you lean here, Tua or Trevor Lawrence? I'm going to lean Trevor Lawrence. Um, but it's tough because, like, the consistency is an issue. But the matchup against the 49ers, they are the number one pass defense in the NFL. So uh, given that matchup, you know, Tyreek Hill and they do have, you know, They've got the explosive options. I like the the ceiling of Trevor Lawrence more than I like Tua this week. I'm going to go on a limb here and say Tua is matchup proof. Because of the footwork and because of the quick release, I really don't think it matters who he's playing, to be honest with you. I think it's 20 points solidified. I think with the receivers they have and with the offensive scheme, it's literally foolproof. It's been foolproof. It's going to continue to be foolproof. And... Um, you're going to see them playing the Chiefs in the AFC Championship game. Not the Chargers anymore, but maybe still the Chargers. <laughs> but yeah, no, I get it. I get the I get the Lawrence um, aspect this week. It's just the matchup is beautiful. It's not so much that I'm banking on Lawrence to ha- take this huge step forward. But mm-hmm. the matchup, man, it's the Lions. We know you can bank on getting points against the Lions. So it's a much closer than, than, than people may think. Um, but I'm, all I'm saying is if you have Tua and you don't have a Lawrence – don't get cute with it and start like, you know, Andy uh, Dalton or some shit. Andy Dalton or something crazy like that. Like it, it, Lawrence is a, is a good start, but if it was anything like maybe two people yeah. less than Lawrence, you know, um, like a, um, you know, uh, not, who? A Mariota against the Steelers. Or Mariota. Or even if you want to start white this week because you're like, hmm, don't do it. Don't do it. Like just keep starting to at this point. But yeah, no, it's, it's a good start. Either of them I think will be doing fine, but I think you can sleep easy starting Lawrence. Okay. My, and I know we might talk dip too deep into the actual matchup there, but the re- the other reason I ask is uh, if we saw what happened last week with Tua, the minute um, they started benching Tua was right after their left tackle got hurt, Armstead, and Armstead's doubtful to play this week, and he's the left tackle. And so 
Bosa is on the other side and that 49ers pass rush can basically, yeah. you know, be a problem. And then obviously again, you get into the dynamics of who's facing who with these coaches, like they know each other. So, you know, like you kind of know tendencies and stuff. So it, it I kind of got really deep into it to where I'm like, okay, if there's a week for Tua and this offense to kind of, you know, somewhat be contained, it's against Kyle Shanahan, who's kind of the mastermind right behind Mike McDaniel. So, uh, so that's why, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I do think it's, it, it's a kind of a, a good, yeah, no, good it's, problem to have. I guess it's a fun point. game, and I, I don't want to get too too much into it either. But it's kind of like imagine this, like Mr. Miyagi and Daniel San, and if this was like you know uh, early in the movie, like like week two, week three, Mr. Miyagi is going to make a fool out of Daniel San, right? But we're at yeah. the freaking almost making the playoff stage. I think the grasshopper has taken over. I, I, I told you guys before the season started, this man is crazy smart. And I think he has enough intel on his guru to like outsmart him. Whether the, does the guru have intel on his new, uh, his pupils um, tendencies and stuff? Not so much. You know, it's like, it's a whole new offense. So I think, I think again, this is closer than we think. I, I have a feeling this is going to be a crazy upset. Uh, it might not, I don't know what the line is or anything. Uh, who's favorite? We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Okay, we'll talk, okay. We have to. We have to get into that. But yeah, yeah you know, yeah. I know. I, I think there's a lot of storylines there, and I I didn't want to start with that because I knew we could get too deep into it. But yeah. it's it's a good problem to have and a good question to pose. But um, I don't know if I have any others. I might have one other ones. But do you guys have any matchups that you're mulling over this week? Starter sit. Yeah, I mean, I I am mulling over Olave versus Michael Pittman Jr. Uh, Olave is facing Tampa Bay, um, and uh, Pittman's facing Dallas. Olave has kind of underperformed since his like hundred point hundred yard game and touchdown game, and Michael Pittman gets the targets, and I feel more comfortable with Matt Ryan as a quarterback than I do um, Andy Dalton. So I'm kind of mulling over that. Olave is still starting for me, but what do you guys think? Ah, uh, that's okay. So that's. That, that's a good one too. I, I think, you know, we talked about Olave early in the season saying he was matchup proof as well and you have to start him. But, um, and I, and I still agree with that. Like the talent means he's matchup proof, but again, situationally, this offense has regressed. I mean, we saw Shashot, you're running back Alvin Kamara, who's like a first round pick, have like two or three really mediocre games in this offense. So this offense is posing some concerns, whereas at least earlier in the season, they were putting up points despite giving up points. Um, I think on the other side of that, Dallas's pass rush could turn, you know, that cow or Cowboys Colts game into like, you know, a blowout to the point where Matt Ryan may not even play to the point where Michael Pittman gets benched like that, that storyline or that game script is in play in that matchup. And the only way to negate that is, is if Jonathan Taylor, Jonathan Taylor runs the football well, which he's been okay, but I still don't bank on that this year or this game for them to be better than the Cowboys at. So for that reason, I still think I would start Chris Olave, but that's where I'm at with it. I think it's really close. Yeah, I think it's the separation is the name of the game, and Michael Pittman's nowhere near Chris Olave in creating separation. So I think if you want opportunities to the ball actually being caught moving forward, I don't. Again, like Olave's elite level, man. Like this guy's really good, and uh, I know the offense sucks, um, but sometimes a sucky offense is good for you. Again, the situation here is really bad. The situation is really bad for Olave because uh, Buccaneers defense is fourth in the league in passing yards allowed. That's high. Right. And um, they're getting a lot of their players back. Antoine Winfield Jr. might play this week. And if that's the case, then this conversation's over because they're going to go back to their Super Bowl to, uh, caliber defense ways. And um, then it's pretty simple because if you think the Cowboys are going to overpower the Colts, which a lot of people do think, and I also think, um, then the Colts are going to have to come from behind a lot of the second half. And who are you going to throw the ball to? Right. Uh, people aren't really as worried about Diggs as. Um, you know, he's not really a shutdown cornerback. He's a playmaker cornerback. So he allows you to catch passes uh, in certain situations. So I, again, like I'm not a big fan of my, uh, uh, Michael Pittman, as you guys know, all year long, it's just been like too, too, too uh, wavering. You know, there's no consistency in this whole offense, all this stuff. Um, but this, this match, I think, I think the, the, the point here is Dallas is favored by like 10 and a half, which means the passing attack has to happen. You know, Colts can't just run the ball the whole yeah. game when the, when the line is 10 and a half. Uh, yeah. versus the other one is three and a half so there's a lot more opportunity for some and the saints have the number saints have the buccaneers number over the last couple of years the saints have tom brady's number um and um you know all that being said i think Olave is still a good start like i'm still starting him in my other league i'm not really gonna mess around because regression matters right like regression is a real thing so i think there's like a medium where Olave kind of hovers sometimes it's a little less sometimes it's a little high but we still haven't seen a boom game and you know at this point if you're gonna hold on to him and you're gonna start him you're just going to have to just throw them into your lineup and just cross your fingers. But having Pittman, I think it's a good situation. I think you might even toss a coin and be happy with the outcome here. 
Yeah, should be interesting. I mean, that that is the, maybe the least of my concerns. My running back situation is just looking terrible. But uh, yeah, it's just something to think about. Olave versus Pittman. I I, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, that, show, I mean, what do you have for us? That, that, that's when you start getting into like the weather and like all this other yeah. stuff because you, you got to find yeah. some sort of. If the matchup's that close, then you have to find an edge somehow. So then that's right. when all the other stuff comes into play. Right. Well, mine, I mean, I am pretty comfortable starting all four of these running backs, whoever I must start, depending on injuries. But who would you start? Pick two, okay? Alvin Kamara against Tampa Bay defense. Um, Rashard White against New Orleans defense with Fournette likely playing. Uh, then you have. Um, Zadonovan or Zonovan Knight <laughs> getting the number one uh, running back reps, which is pretty much confirmed at this point against the Vikings defense, which is ranked fourth in run defense because you can just throw on them like crazy. Yeah. And, or uh, do you start? Um, do I have anybody else I could possibly start over them? Yeah. Brian Robinson against New York giants with Gibson being injured and being limited today. Hmm. I Which think Brian Robinson is a start for me, um, especially with the Gibson injury. The second person, man, it's crazy that I'm going to say this over. You know, I think Alvin Kamara for me. Um, I don't know about the report on Zonovan. Is Zonovan right? Zonovan Knight. Zonovan, yeah, yeah. I th- I think that Michael Carter should be coming back. And he didn't uh, practice today. Didn't practice today. I don't think he didn't practice today. Okay. Um, so I'm not really sold on his number one uh, RB1. Uh, and then there's also the other guy that they have. Um, Ty Johnson, but he's a pass down guy. Right, yeah. Ty Johnson as well. And so it, it, it worries me. So I'm, yeah, for me, it's going to be, you know, Alvin Kamara and Brian Robinson. I think that's what, that's what my, my head's at too. I think that's where I'm going at because volume is the name of the game, right? At the end of the day, it's just volume for me. I don't, I really don't care. Matchups come second to volume for me. That's why people are still starting Pierce, right? That's why people, that's why you see Pierce on people's lineup still because there's no backup. So you just, you just kind of pray. So for that reason, I, I, I'm, I benched Kamara last week, actually. You know, a lot of people would probably be like, what the fuck are you doing? But I benched him and I, I actually got more points out of the guy I started, even though he got hurt or whatever. Um, so, but this week, I don't really have that level of comfort. So I think I'm going to go with, Camara, uh, just from the side of volume, and it's Tampa Bay, so I, he's probably going to get wrecked. But you know, at this point, whatever. And then uh, Brian Robinson, if you're going to get close to 26 touches a game, if Gibson's out, dude, I don't care who you are. Like it doesn't matter what your name is. If you're getting 26 touches a game against the Chiefs defense, um, or sorry, against the Giants defense, which is going to be a close game all game, so they're going to be running all the game long. So yeah, I think that's where I'm leaning. Any anything else to adjust to that, Sweetheart? No, I think, yeah, I think I, I lean away from Zonovan just because of the unknown there and you have players that you do know. I would also absolutely start Kamara just because you made the right move in benching him and now he's had, what, three in, subpar weeks in a row? Yeah. And he's he's too talented a player that, that I, I don't think that's the median, right? Like regression back to what he does is, is what usually happens when a superstar has multiple mediocre games. And again, against Tampa Bay, you know, they're going to be down. And they have their number. So it's a weird, it's a weird matchup for them because in the past years, Tampa Bay's offense, the last two years has been like number one in the league and the saints somehow come into town and like shut the shit out of them, like shut them down. And then this year, the saints defense is atrocious, but Tampa Bay's offense can't do, hasn't really been doing anything. Right. So that's why uh, it, it's, it's an interesting dynamic there where there is so much unknown in that matchup that you start the stud. And then, like you said, especially if Gibson is limited, hurt, or there's any sort of injury designation towards Gibson, then automatically Robinson becomes a star. I forget who the fourth guy even was, but I Rashard like, White. If Fournette uh, doesn't play, yeah. If, if Fournette, Fournette doesn't, doesn't play, play, yeah, then he's an Come auto here. star. Come here, auto star, star, yeah. But, auto start Rashad White if Fournette doesn't play, but Fournette coming back, and if he's coming back healthy, then yeah, it's just it's a you know it's a it's a stupid split situation. Yeah. And it just so happens to be the same game Monday night, Kamara versus Rashad White if they both if Fournette <laughs> oh, ends up. Oh, yeah. Wow, a lot of implications heading into Monday. Oh yeah. Um. Okay. So my other league. I have uh, DeAndre Hopkins, my wide receiver, too. He's on a bye. So I have Pickens as a possible play against Atlanta. But my only concern there is I also have Fryermuth as my tight end in that league. And it just feels weird having to start two Pittsburgh Steelers pass catchers, uh, you know, in an offense that just isn't throwing the ball for barely 200 yards a game. So my options there are Pickens as a wide receiver, too. And then my flex is Pollard, who I don't feel great about, right? So Pickens and Pollard. And then I have two guys on my bench. I have uh, Joshua Palmer. And I have Latavius Murray. So there's an option that I could 
potentially start Palmer in for Pickens, and then I could start Latavius for Pollard because Latavius is RB1, even though Pollard is explosive. But out of those four guys, how would you kind of carve that up? Who does Latavius play this week? Baltimore. Great run defense. I like um, Palmer this week uh, because uh, Williams, Mike I- Williams, was limited play. in practice. He, I don't know. I don't. He was just probably doing like stretches in practice or something like that because he wasn't mm-hmm. there on the field. So Joshua Palmer, number two uh, receiver. I like his uh, odds there. And then and over- against Vegas, that's against Vegas too. Right, right. thirty first ranked. Yeah. yeah. And was Pollard player. the other one? Yeah, and then it's Pollard as my flex, but I also have Latavius Murray as a flex option too. And with Zeke having kind of a nice game last week, all of a sudden you know you kind of. Pump the brakes a little bit on Tony Pollard. I don't know. At least you you think you think about it. It's a good matchup for Pollard. They're playing the Colts, and Colts aren't the great greatest in the run defense. Um, but George Pickens is seeming to be the guy that if you know they're going, they're, if they're throwing the ball, they're throwing the ball ball to George Pickens. I mean, he's like the wide receiver one at this point. Like not yeah. in the depth chart, but you know. Um, so I think I like Pickens um, as your other play there as my flex so i could basically just start palmer as our wide receiver two and pickens as flex over pollard and latavius do you guys think i'm reading too much into the whole starting who, who are you playing what, what's this what's this guy who is this guy is he have a good team yeah i mean the guy i'm playing against is six and six he's got herbert mccaffrey miles sanders dk metcalf amari cooper cd lamb dawson knox cairo santos and indianapolis defense okay so that's solid. pretty pretty yeah pretty solid team yeah I, i'm on i Dude, I I just love home run hitters that get the touches. And if if Pollard gets like 15 touches, he's going to be like a must start. And that's so hard for me to not go to. But I also love volume. And if Latavius Murray is getting 20 touches a game, I don't care what Pollard's going to do for you because I'll take 20 touches over 15 touches as in RB1 any day of the week. And um, and you said they were playing who? Who who, who the Broncos playing in? Uh, Broncos are playing the Ravens, who have the good, Ravens. Run defense. They're good run defense. Think, oh, fuck, man, this is tough. This is That's tough. You tough. can go safe. The safe option is Pollard and Pickens. Because, uh, sorry, uh, safe options. Safe option is a Palmer and Pickens, right? Yeah. Palmer gonna get his targets. They're gonna have to throw the ball. Raiders are not a bad team. I know. I know we like to like like rail on them, but they yeah. put up thirty points. You know, and like. Uh, it's be starting to become a little more consistent. So the Chargers are going to have to keep up. There's still not enough weapons to go around. They still have to throw the ball to Palmer. The chances of Palmer getting in the end zone is pretty damn high. And then Pickens, on the other hand, if you just eliminate, let's say you don't have Friar Muth on the team and you're not thinking of it from a bias standpoint, yeah. they got to get in the end zone, right? they got to score the ball. Although I bet the over-under is like, what, 38 or some shit? Like it's probably so low. 36, 38, what is it? 42. 42. Okay. I live there a little bit higher than I am, but it's like, it's such a, like, it's a run heavy, like grinded out game and someone's going to have to score. And it, I don't, I don't believe Najee Harris. If he plays is going to, I'm not really worried about him as much anymore. Um, and Pickens, if you look at like the last six games, he's had amazing games besides like one game, he's had double digit fantasy points in every single game. So if you're talking safe route, if you're, if you know, you're going to, your other players are going to put up some points and you just need like some double digit points here and there, Palmer and Pickens, are definitely going to give you some points. But if Zeke's getting hot and they're taking a huge lead, Pollard may not get, go for those 30-point days. You know what I mean? And then Latavius, yeah. if some reason they, their offense stays the way the shitty way it does, Latavius could easily give you like an 8.7. So yeah. safe versus boomer bust. And the only boomer bust here outside of the two that we mentioned for the safe is uh, Pollard, right? So. Yeah. Damn, this is this is this is tough. But I, I think I would I think me and Shobit are on the same page here as far as the two people. Yeah. Palmer, Palmer and Pickens, Palmer and Pickens, yeah. or Palmer and Pollard, Palmer and Pickens. Okay, Palmer and Pickens. I, Palmer I also Pickens. think that the Broncos would be stupid to go Latavius Murray so heavy. Like you know, you're you're probably like having to get ready for the next season and trying to figure out which players you want to keep on your team. Like Mike Boone comes back from IR. And you probably want to roll out with him more than you want with Latavius Murray. Why? They're, they're the same. Like, Boone has been a perennial backup. He's been a third string every opportunity. Every time there's a healthy player, he's a backup. That should tell you something. Like, he, he he's kind of like Daryl Henderson. Like, don't fall into this Daryl Henderson trap. Like, they only get to start when the opportunity arises. But when there's other players that are there that are healthier, they, they'll never start. So, they're like, and now they have two of those same players, Latavius Murray and Boone in the same neck and neck. I think they're just going to ride at, ride this season out. Just try to take a 
I don't know what they're going to do. Nobody knows what they're going to do. But I don't think I don't think there's like a future that you're kind of worried about with Boone. I know he's a good player and everything. Like I've seen some flashes. We've seen some flashes when he played for the Vikings. He had some crazy runs, especially in preseason. I think he had like a 50 yard touchdown every game of preseason. Some crazy like that. But um, like don't don't fall into the Daryl Henderson trap with uh, with Boone. Yeah, I think and yeah, and even if that was the case, right? It's one of those things where if Boone they saw was the future, then they would rest him because this this rest of the season kind of means nothing, right? So Latavius is like a guy you can basically just work to the ground because he's on a one year contract and they're not going to bring him back because he's old anyways, right? But the thing with Latavius is everywhere he goes, he's somewhat productive. He's like decent enough yeah. that he gets playing time. How did he just get picked up on the practice squad of the Bron- by the Broncos and and oversee like supersede Melvin Gordon and all the other running backs? You know, like so. Even even with the Raiders, he played with them like one week or whatever, or was it the Raiders? It was saints, saints, like one week and he did well. So like everywhere he goes, he, he does well. And so I think, Again, they have no incentive. Militavius is in the future because of age and like he's expendable. Boone is in the future because he's a backup. So it's really a, it doesn't really matter situation for them, but yeah. Okay. So I guess for me, it's, I'm just going to have to make a decision closer to the, uh, the game time situation, but it's a good problem to have. And again, it's the league where I don't even have to really look at my lineup and they end up putting up points. So I'm not really worried about like my sixth or seventh player on the roster. That's going to just be the icing on top to like my already 120 points that my team will put up. So yeah, nice. That's awesome. Last (laughs) last week I put up 130 points and still took the L. So yeah, I'm like losing sleep over that week. That that happens that I, I play against Ishan this week and I was looking at our matchup last time I played him and it was 147 to 138. I lost. So, you know, fuck like, you know, best game I had all year. I didn't win. win. Uh, Anybody else, any other lineup questions you guys have anything you're mulling over? I don't think so. I don't think so. No, you're good. Yeah. I'm not good. Jalen Warren. I have Jalen Warren, so I'm still yeah. mulling that. Like, if if he's he's 100 healthy, obviously he's full of part participants. So if Najee doesn't play, do I deploy Warren full or is this send. McFarland and Snell crap? No, I'm you full cool. send uh, Jalen Warren if Najee is not playing. You think so? Oh yeah, hundred percent. I I mean, I wish I had Warren, and you know, as Najee as my backup, uh, or Najee as my starter. If Warren was there, it, I wouldn't be sweating as I am right now. With Najee starting and no uh, handcuffs, I, I am. Yeah, sorry. I remember. I remember this conversation four weeks ago, Trevor. <laughs> Me too. I remember. I was like, "Why are you like, picking up other people's handcuff- backups and not your own backups?" And you're like, "I don't know. I just kind of like these backups." Well, this he is lives, the pain no, you have to lives, deal with. He lives life on the edge, so he's rather he'd rather handcuff opponents' backups than his own backups. Well, that's similar. Our 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 uh, league needs to trade more often. Is what needs to happen. Okay, I, bro. I, I've been literally talking about trades every fucking day. And nobody wants to send me shit. I'm not even in the playoffs. I have some pretty good players on my team. I'm surprised nobody has sent me an offer. I'm I like actually that. You give me Jonathan Taylor, but your your asking price is gonna be too high for Jonathan Taylor. I'm. I don't think I'm gonna ask for too high. I'm just gonna be like, I'm not gonna get fucked for you guys to like excel in the playoffs. Like it's gonna be a fair trade. But at this point, I'm playing for really nothing, right? So yeah. I'm not gonna try to fuck somebody over because I don't really have as much incentive. I just want an even trade, and I'm, you know, like I want, I want more mix and match for the rest of this league or the rest of the season as a spectator, basically as well. That's kind of my situation. No, I get that. Yeah. I get that. But we'll see. We'll see. Anything else? I'm good. I'm good on lineups. You guys good? That is it for Water Cooler Talk, guys. Let's jump into the rundown. Two teams on by this week, the Arizona Cardinals and the Carolina Panthers. For the Panthers, I was thinking about it. I mean, outside of Foreman, probably nobody really fantasy-wise that it did even mattered. For the Cardinals, though, there are some fantasy implications with Kyler, Connor, Brown, Hopkins, you know, so uh, those are guys that you're probably, you know, working around this week in your lineup, as am I with DeAndre. Um, without further ado, though, guys, first game on the board, the Steelers at the Falcons this week. Pittsburgh on the road, favored by one. Have the tides turned for Pittsburgh? Over under 42. Najee, injury concerns. We were talking about this earlier. That's my biggest thing about this game because if Najee is hurt from a fantasy perspective, Jalen Warren seems like a easy, easy just auto start. Um, we've seen Benny Snell in this offense before. We've seen Anthony McFarland in this offense before. And I think if they were going to get 
workload, it would have already happened. And so seeing Jalen Warren come in later and supersede those guys who have already been on the team, uh, I think leads me to believe that if Najee is hurt, Jalen Warren's fully healthy, he's got to be the guy. So uh, I would feel pretty confident with that as well. And it's Atlanta and it's a pretty favorable matchup. So uh, Atlanta's defense is 24th against fantasy running backs and they're 30th against fantasy wide receivers. That's why I had the Pickens conundrum, right? Because it's a great matchup. So uh, from, from the Pittsburgh side, an offense that has been lacking for most of the season, you're finding pretty nice spots in this matchup, 21st against tight ends. So it's like Pickens, Muth, and whatever running back gets to start seem like pretty good options against Atlanta. And then on the Atlanta side, it's a weird situation because Pittsburgh's 32nd against wide receivers, but who do you start and who do you trust? Drake London hasn't gotten more than seven targets since week two. Olavides Zacchaeus was the leading receiver last week, two weeks in a row. It was Demir bird. So it's like, who the hell are you going to start? Uh, it's nobody. such a, sh- it's a shit. And Kyle Pitts is hurt. So it's like, it's a fantasy uh, players like dream scenario, but there's not one guy that's like the dream startable position. So like it, it's, it's a weird situation. I expect maybe one of these guys to do well, but it's like so impossible to know who that guy is going to be. So I think on that side, outside of Cordero Patterson, maybe if you're streaming Mariota, there's not really anybody else that's startable young way Koo, if we're talking kickers. Uh, but on Pittsburgh side, it's the running back Pickens and Firemuth. What else do you guys got? Yeah, no, nothing. Just, uh, like don't fall for this, uh, 32nd ring Pittsburgh defense stuff because this isn't the same defense with JJ Watt there. It's a whole different defense. So, uh, <laughs> sorry, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Either Watt, either Watt, to be honest. <laughs> either Watt at this age will be crazy good. Um, so, yeah, this stat I'm sure is with like the whole year's uh, data. So, you know, I want to see post TJ Watt data and then, then we'll talk. Yeah, nothing to add. Go Steelers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, something to something to really quickly add on the Steelers uh, situation here. So I'm going to name three players, right? So these players. Do you remember James Washington? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you remember? Do you remember Edo Smith? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Edo Smith. Edo Smith. Edo Smith. Yeah, I E T O, right? I T O. Oh, it's I T O. Yeah, exactly. That oh, he was okay. a running back for the Falcons. Oh. Okay. I, I, okay. And then Le'Veon Bell. Right, these three players have scored a touchdown more recently than Deontay Johnson. Wow! Whoa. Yeah, wow! Yeah, and wow. All, three, all three of them don't play right now, so it's been a long time since Deontay scored. Um, I can't. Yeah, at this point, week, you can't even feel bad for him because he's he had the he had as good a chance as he's going to get all season last week. Yeah, he's got more targets than pretty much anybody else on the team by far, by like twenty targets or something. So I, I don't know. It's just just be careful. Be careful if you're going to still start him. All right, Packers at Bears. Man, wow. So you guys know who the owner of the Bears is, right? It's Aaron Rodgers. I don't I don't know. I don't care what Wikipedia says. It's Aaron Rodgers. Green Bay is only favored by four and a half over unders at 43 and a half. Um, you know, Rodgers, if he plays, you start him. I don't care about his thumb. I don't care about anything. I don't care about how he's doing. He's actually not doing so bad. I know, I know in the grand scheme of things, is he's had like a worse season than what we're used to seeing, but there's a lot of factors in play here. And like, you know, their, their defense is trash. You know, he's always had a pretty solid defense to, it matters. It really matters. This like, you know, it matters. No matter how good you are, you need a good defense to carry you. And um, he, you know, you, you start the owner of the bears and you, you don't really worry about it because the bears put little to no pressure. They're 31st in the league in sacks. And if Aaron Rodgers has time, God bless whoever those receivers are because they're going to get some touchdowns. And the Packers are still fourth in passing touchdowns, right? So we're talking about Aaron Rodgers having a bad year. Well, fourth in passing touchdowns, okay? Fourth in passing touchdowns. So that's like guaranteed 18 points floor. So if, if you're worried about starting Mariota, please don't start Mariota and start Aaron Rodgers because I'm sure he's available in your league. Uh, Aaron Jones. Um, you got to start Aaron Jones. He's doing super awesome this year. Uh, Bears are 32nd in rushing touchdowns allowed. And uh, the Packers, unfortunately, haven't really gotten into the end zone as much from the running perspective. Um, but the Bears are also 30th in rushing yards allowed. And we know Aaron Jones just keeps chunking up yards left and right. So he's bound to rumble into the end zone here this game. Um, and, you know, um, I, I did I did say that they don't really score money touchdowns on the ground. Uh, to put it in a statistical reference, uh, Packers are 30th in the league in rushing touchdowns. Uh, from their running backs. So I think this game, you know, you don't worry about that stat. You worry more about the bears being 32nd and uh, allowing rushing touchdowns. And I think you start uh, Aaron Jones. I'm still a little hesitant on starting uh, Dylan. I'm, uh, that's too risky at this point. I'd rather start a brand. I start, a, I start, I'd rather start um, 
what's his name? Donovan. Zonovan. Zonovan I'd rather start Knight. Him. I'd rather start him than I would start uh, uh, Dylan. And the other positions to start on the Packers, you start Watson, man. You start Christian Watson. He's on a historic pace. It's kind of it's kind of wild. He's got more touchdowns in the last three day uh, three games than C.D. Lamb. Tyreek Hill has all year. Evans has all year. Justin Jefferson has all year. Debo Samuel, Metcalf, the list goes on and on. Um, you got to start him. It's too hot of a trend to not uh, follow. And, um, I, you know, it's just there's nowhere else to go. Also, Lazard was that guy for a while, but he doesn't have the speed that Watson has. And Watson just needs to catch the ball once and he'll be in the end zone <laughs> probably. So I think it's a it's a good matchup. Aaron Rodgers is going to do really well against the Bears. And who's going to catch his ball? Watson. So I wouldn't. I feel super comfortable starting all three of these players. Uh, on the From the Bears perspective, there's not much here, but I'm going to give you all the highlights. Uh, Bears are number one in rush yards uh, in the league, and that's mainly because of the fields. Um, rushing touchdowns, they're ranked fifth. Rushing red zone touchdowns, they're ranked 10th. Passing yards, they're 32nd because they don't care about throwing the ball. Uh, that means you go, you start their running backs, right? So Monty, you expect a um, pretty good day. Anytime he's an RB1 without this backup hindrance, this like parasite following around, he scores over, he averages over 16 fantasy points, which is clearly in the top 10 in fantasy running backs. Um, and um, Fields, you know, he was a full practice today. Got that late news around five o'clock that he's a full practice. Um, but are you that stupid, Bears? Like, what are you doing? Like, why are you even thinking about playing him? Why don't you just shut him down? If, the, if It's a separated shoulder. It's not a stinger. It's not like a bruise. Like, it's a separated shoulder. That shit can come back out. And, like, if that happens, the Bears are forever going to be the shittiest franchise ever um, in my eyes because you're going to risk that for absolutely nothing. When you know the future is so bright and you have all these picks to just sprinkle all around fields, you're going to try yeah. to risk his shoulder injury. And <laughs> so. the franchise isn't even hiding the fact that they're basically openly tanking. So it just makes no sense to play yeah. fields too soon. So that's why you got to be super careful with him. He could easily, easily be an early Sunday morning like, oh, by the way, he's not playing anymore. So be absolutely Hawkeyes on his injury designation. Uh, Cole Komet, he's been number tight end number th- uh, six uh, in usage um, this year. Not chasing touchdowns. This is outside of touchdowns when we're not even including the two touchdowns that one game and the one touchdown the game before. We're talking straight up usage. The amount of times he runs routes, the amount of times he gets balls thrown at him, all that stuff. He's tight end number six, which is very good, which is very good. Um, but that that definitely hinders on with who the quarterback is playing. So. Again, be careful with that. And then stashing, I wouldn't really jump the gun and start Claypool this game, but uh, there's been you know uptick on his usage, and um, I would stash him just to kind of see because they have nobody else. Mooney just left the season forever, and all they have is Cole Komet and literally nobody else. Equinemia St. Brown is an embarrassment to the family, unfortunately. And um, so it's just Claypool, right? So Claypool is all you got in Bears land. And if they want to score points, you got to get the ball to Claypool at least like 10 times a game at this point. So uh, that means you got to have him on your roster. You're not going to start him, but you may, some people may, but have him on your roster. Man, the only reason Fields should start is because he's starting, he's on my fantasy team. Other than that, I wish him the best. All right, next up, we've got the Jacksonville Jaguars traveling to Detroit to face the Lions. Jacksonville is favored by one point, and the over-under is at 51 and a half points. And I think that might be the highest um, this week, which is crazy to think. Mm-hmm. Um, Jaguars, uh, fantasy guys you want to start are, uh, so Travis Etienne, uh, something to note, he was limited in Thursday's practice. He had a uh, injury in the second quarter last week. And so uh, if he it doesn't play, it looks like he's, probably going to play but if he doesn't uh jamichael hasty is a must start they did sign daryl uh, henderson from the waivers but i still think that hasty is going to be the rb1 on that team and so you can definitely start him if he uh if, if etienne's out um and also lions run defense is terrible allowing more than five yards per carry so whoever gets that starting uh job is should have a field day um, Trevor Lawrence is a start. We talked about him, Trevor Lawrence versus Tua. I like Lawrence this week. He is coming off of a hot week. Last, uh, last week against the Ravens, he looked like a poised quarterback in the NFL, um, something we've been missing in the first six weeks. And so Lawrence is a good start here. Christian Kirk, um, you know, nine targets in week 12. Could continue that uh, it, with the uh, scheme that they may 
uh, deploy, which is basically pass the ball uh, against this Lions defense. Just do anything, anything on offense against this Lions defense, really. Zay Jones uh, also is an interesting starter. Last week, he had uh, 14 targets, 11 reception, 145 yards. He was limited in practice, so basically monitor that. And if you need someone to stream, uh, Zay Jones is an interesting start this week. Evan Ingram, not so much. He's not seeing enough volume to warrant a start. I would stay away from him. Uh, on the Lions side, uh, Jamal Williams is, you know, I don't know if he leads the rushing touchdowns, but he's doing very well. He's looking like the RB1 there. You still, you continue starting him. DeAndre Swift, we talked about him about, what, you know, why would anyone even start him? Well, he did see eight targets last game. It could be a start against this Jags pass defense. Amon Ray St. Brown, you definitely start him. Jags pass defense allows 93.2 uh, QBR rating to receivers. And then lastly, Jameson Williams. You're not going to start Jameson Williams, but he is suiting up. And I was watching some, you know, uh, practice highlights on on Twitter, and he looks fast, man. So he could be one of those guys, like in your uh, playoffs, that can end up having a solid, you know, the reason that you you win. So just keep him on your bench. Don't start him. Let's see what the, see what happens. But uh, in this game, you know, I'm just watching to see is this Trevor Lawrence thing for real. I believe it is, but you know, that's something that I am looking out for. Should be a fun matchup, a high scoring affair, uh, 51 and a half over under uh, over that like like I mentioned. Um, so yeah, let, let's see if uh, this is uh, to stay for Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, I think with uh, Jameson Williams, it's an interesting daily fantasy lineup uh, pick as well. He's probably super cheap because they're not expecting him to play much, and he's just like a one home run hitter kind of guy. So he could get a deep bomb touchdown and be a solid fantasy play. So uh, that's one thing to look out for. What are you going to say, Shook? Um, actually, let me just audible real quick. As of seven minutes ago, Antonio Brown is reportedly in a standoff with police. He has an arrest warrant for his domestic battery, and he has guns in the house. So, um, shit's going down. Stay tuned. It's on your brow, man. That writing was on the wall. That writing's been on the wall for a oh, while yeah. now. I, I, already, I already know Kanye West in a couple of months is going to do something stupid, too. <laughs> so, it's all just coming. Uh, the things that are happening in this world, crazy. New York Jets, the next game on the board. They're traveling to Minnesota to take on our Vikings. Vikings only getting the home field advantage against this really, really good defense. Vikings favored by three points over under 44 and a half. Uh, the storyline that, you know, all the mainstream media is going to tell you is Justin Jefferson against Sauce Gardner, Justin Jefferson against Sauce Gardner, which sounds really great. It's amazing. I hope we get to see it a little bit, but Sauce Gardner stays on one side. Other side guy, DJ Reader. Justin Jefferson plays in the slot as well. Slot guy, Michael Carter. So it doesn't, we don't know who's going to be guarding Justin Jefferson in this game. That is definitely something to watch out for. The Jets defense is no fucking joke though. They're top 12 in the league. The reason I say 12 is there's only one thing that they're actually outside of like the top five in and it's rushing yards allowed, which they're 12th in, but everything else they're basically top five total yards, passing yards, rushing yards, points allowed, sacks, turnover differential. So everything that's important for defenses, they're good at. So this is a really, really interesting matchup for this Vikings offense because uh, the, the the reason why you feel good about this matchup maybe two weeks ago is no matter how good this Jets defense is, they still have Zach Wilson who's going to basically uh, yeah. fuck up the game for them somewhere, somehow. Now it's Mike White. And with Mike White, somehow... I don't know where we are. Alternate universe. This offense is really scary. It's a lot scarier with Mike White playing quarterback for whatever reason. And the Vikings defense, men don't break. They've broken at times and they're bad. So they do really, really timely things, timely sacks, timely turnovers, timely stop on third down. But statistically, they're not very, very good. So uh, I, I do worry. Garrett Wilson, Elijah Moore, those are not, you know, receivers to, uh, Oh, you know, take lightly, if you will. And so there's a lot to like if you're on the Jets side here in this matchup. And again, for the Vikings, they're really there's really no blueprint here because, like I said, the defense is good for the Jets, but their offense, you're game planning some completely differently than you would if, again, two weeks ago you were playing this team, right? So the Jets have all their losses this year because Zach Wilson was their quarterback. Four losses, all with Zach Wilson at the helm. So the Jets have not lost when Zach Wilson or when Mike White's the quarterback. So there is no blueprint to beat this team right now yet. Uh, so that's a scary, that's a scary sight for me. Uh, so the Vikings, in my opinion, will have their hands full. Despite all of that, you're going to start Dalvin Cook. You're going to start Justin Jefferson. You're probably going to start TJ Hawkinson. Uh, Jets running back situation is a little bit interesting. We talked about the whole Michael Carter injury. James Robinson hasn't played much, and he, you know, vocally, verbally said he was unhappy about that this couple this past week. So uh, I don't know what's going to go on with him. Um, and then again, Garrett Wilson, you're probably starting just because the volume has started started to go there with a guy that can actually throw the football. And Gronklin, again, it's the Vikings defense, and their pass defense is allowing a shit ton of yards. So the worst. Wilson, it's the worst in the league now. Yes. 
So, uh, you know, again, I, I'm having to say all this without, you know, the even an ounce of bias, Homer bias as a Vikings fan being like, you can literally deploy any New York jet and I wouldn't be surprised if they go off. So I expect a lot of points to be had. The Vikings are going to have to score points to stay in this game, even though the Jets defense is super vaunting and all this, as long as we play it like we can play it. We played last week where we played against the Patriots defense where that defense was, uh, you know, monstrous coming into the week. We figured out how to chip a Judon. It wasn't like the week before where we were letting Micah Parsons play one-on-one against our backup left tackle. So having all of that extra protection and help in that week to prepare, I think we're still going to be able to put up some points against this Jets defense, uh, but it is going to be a tall, tall order. I like it. I like it. I am terrified of this game, so I'd like to hear anything positive possible. Um, so if you want to talk about having uh, watching a good game this week uh, where you just want to sit with your dad and just grab a beer and just watch some grind and park, you know, just rush and attack, uh, you're going to want to watch the Commanders at the Giants. The Giants are uh, the Commanders are favored by two and a half. The over unders at forty and a half. Uh, commanders, what do we want to talk about? Well, you know Gibson, he was the guy doing a lot of the third down work and the rushing attack. But then Brian Robinson came back from getting shot, and he's been alternating with Gibson at a very erratic um, rate, where it's not predictable. They don't know. We don't know when who's going to do what. This is the least predictable backfield in all of football, and. I have been watching football for a very long time. This is absolutely unpredictable. I don't know who's going to do what at when. But we are seeing a slight uptick in the usage in Brian Robinson. And I think it's been like a a month now. And we're seeing that when the game needs to be uh, close, when it's a close game, it's a Brian Robinson's game. And like I said earlier, it's predicted to be a close game. Um, Washington's favored by two and a half. Um, So I'm expecting a full-on rushing attack on both ends. Just rush, rush, rush. Um, And then I think Brian Robinson is going to have a pretty good day. Uh, Gibson's still limited, like we mentioned earlier, so that even points more towards more Brian Robson usage. Um, and the only other player I'm really even worried about starting on the commander's end is Terry McLaurin. Um, Giants D is actually sixth overall in passing touchdowns allowed, so not as confident as like you know playing the Raiders or the Chargers, stuff like that. Um, and you know, so just be a little wary. There are other players in other games we're going to talk about, which you know we're way more recommending of uh, to start. Uh, TMC, I know a lot of people are going to start. So if you're listening and you have TMC, there's a huge asterisk on this matchup because, you know, he may do well, but um, the chances are they're going to run 60% to 70% of the time here. So, uh, you know, the volumes just may not be there. Um, From the Giants perspective, Daniel Jones, right? The ultimate streamer. He's like Mariota, but slightly better. And uh, so you're banking on legs. You're banking on the rushing attack because he's 29th in pass yards, 29th in passing touchdowns. It's just not something you want a part of this late into the season, trying to make the playoffs. You're not really doing this for his arm. You're doing this for his legs. The team is fifth in rushing touchdowns, sixth in rushing yards. And, um, you know, you would think it's all Saquon, but no, it's a lot of it is Daniel Jones. He does a really well job, a really good job of running the ball. Um, Saquon's the other player you would probably start. You're most likely going to start. Um, uh, he's been good, but he hasn't been great. You know, he's been like the most serviceable player in all of football. Um, he's averaging around 16 fan- 16.6 fantasy points. He's had like two games where he's scored over two- 20 points, and he has one game where he scored over 30 points. Everything else has been in the teens, and there's been like one game in the ones. So you're you're not getting like what you're seeing from Eckler. You're not getting what you're seeing from Josh Jacobs. You're getting this like very monotonous but very happy uh, 17, 15, 13, 20, 17, 15, 13. It's your 24. favorite kind of player. It's yeah. the consistent force. Because exactly, it's reliable. I can organize the rest of my team using this data. I don't have to use this data and add that to the algorithm for the week, right? It's like that is done. 15 points. Check mark. Let's worry about the kicker now. So you have more room worrying about the kicker now, knowing you have security. So yeah, love it. Love it. It's just, you know, just be wary. If you're if if you if you gotta start, you know, a lot of those smaller leagues, you have Josh Jacobs and you have Saquon, and then you're down by whatever points going into whatever situation. Those are the kind of situations where you'd have to be like, oh shit, I should probably start, you know, Josh Jacobs over Saquon this week or something like that. But I don't know about the time. Uh, this game's probably at one o'clock, so you're probably not gonna worry about that kind of stuff. But that's the kind of player Saquon is this year. He's not that 30 point a game kind of guy. He's more of a, hey, I'll make you happy. I just, you know, you just won't be like using me as your uh, whatever. You guys know what I'm talking about. Um, so anyways, um, don't forget commanders are also number three overall in rushing touchdowns allowed this year. So that's just more salt to add to the wound of this game. I'm just expecting a lot of rush, rush, punt, rush, punt, rush, punt, field goal, rush, punt, field goal. 
and then somehow somewhere some somewhere something happens in the passing and then then they win the game so uh yeah that's that's my analysis for the game and i'm pretty sure that's exactly how it's gonna go god that sounds dreadful well not unless you have graham gano or joey sly i guess <laughs> that's true yeah that's true. or you take I mean, or, or if you can get 25 touches from either of the running backs i'll, I'll take that yeah. too <laughs> yeah what's the line on punting all right, next up, we've got the Tennessee Titans at Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, Eagles are favored by five points over under at 44 and a half. I'll start with fantasy on the Titans side. So you're going to start with Derrick Henry. But um, you speak about Saquon Barkley not performing well, that well. Did, uh, Derrick Henry, uh, under 3.3 yard or three yards per game in the last two uh, game yards per carry, sorry, in the last two games. So he's kind of underwhelming in that sense. But he is in a, in a uh, very opportunistic uh, position here facing the Eagles. Um, and um, Traylon Burks uh, is another guy you want to look at in fantasy-wise. He did not practice Thursday because of an I- illness, although the Eagles' pass defense uh, is allows a QBR rating of 68.4 to wide receivers, which is the best in the league. You're probably shying away from Traylon Burks, uh, even if he is going to suit up. On the Eagles' side, deploy all, deploy it's not every- Traylon? I've been saying Traylon like my whole life. I think, I, I think it's Traylon. No, I think it's Traylon, actually. I, uh, uh, I see you noted it as specifically Trey I, Lane. Yeah, I specific because I heard it today as Traylon. So I'm I, I'm pretty sure it's Traylon. But we'll come oh. back to that uh, next yeah. next week and I'll, I'll confirm, confirm that for sure. <laughs> um, on the Eagles side, deploy all, deploy everybody, everybody Jalen Hurts, Miles Sanders, uh, Devontae Smith, AJ Brown. Um, but not Quez Watkins because I just don't want to deploy a wide receiver three uh, for my fantasy unless I really, really have to, which I I doubt you're in that position that you have to start Quez Watkins. Um, But all the other guys you definitely want to start. So the game script for the Eagles, the Eagles like to run the ball. They're going to run the ball often. They had 49 attempts last week in week 12, uh, but now they face a Titans rush defense that is allowing 3.8 yards per carry to running backs and four yards per carry uh, to quarterbacks. So they face Daniel Jones and Josh Allen, which are both different type of players and different team. So that 4.4 uh, 4 yards per carry probably doesn't mean anything, but something to think about. You know, they're they're facing a uh, a tough opponent when uh, that is not going to allow them to run all over them. Uh, Titans' pass defense is pretty bad, though. They allow QBR 104.1 rate to receivers, which is why I think Devontae Smith and AJ Brown are, are going to be great, great, um, you know, great matches for them this week. Uh, how, although the Titans pass rush is respectable for the Titans. So um, the Titans need to just find a way to get home and uh, sack, um, you know, Jalen Hurts. Uh, they have three defensive guys that are, have uh, sacks of over five and a half uh, this year. So they've got the guys to get to Jalen Hurts, whether or not that happens, we'll, we'll 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 see. And I think the Titans are going to continue doing what they always try to do, which is run the ball, keep the Eagles' offense in the sidelines, uh, with Derrick Henry just you know bruising the uh, Eagles' defense. Uh, the Eagles are are terrible in in terms of uh, allowing yardage to running backs. We saw what Washington did to them, so the Titans need to do the same thing. And then last thing I want to note is Tannehill has been playing pretty well. And I think if he's decent, he's been uh, having he has 255 plus passing yards in the third three straight games. So if he just plays decent and allows uh, Derrick Henry to do Derrick Henry things, I think that the uh, Titans have a chance of winning if they follow that script. Whether or not that comes to fruition, and we'll see on Sunday. But um, yeah, you know it should be interesting an interesting matchup to say the least. I feel like do the do the Titans have another game script? I feel like it's just this I, always. <laughs> no, I think this is it always. Yeah, I mean, they play the Bills. This is what they're going to do. They play any good team they play, like whoever they play. This is uh, all. don't suck and Henry do good. That, yeah. That's yeah. the game script. Got it, coach. Their, their, their offense is literally designed so that the other team has the ball the le- as least amount of time yeah. as possible, and that's why they run the football so much, right? Yeah. The reason I bring that up, too, is because, like, that same tactic worked with the commanders against the Eagles. They also had turnovers, though. That was also the case. Yeah, man, I, you guys just latching onto that one game and just forgetting about all these other games where the Eagles just dominate. So it's like, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sold. I'm not sold on this. The thing is, you got to have the Eagles suck in order to run the ball against them. That's the thing. Like, even if their run defense sucks, like, who's stopping Jalen Hurts from scoring touchdowns? Probably nobody. So, like, it's it's the plan. Like, I hope, I hope some more teams can do that because they need to start losing some games. But 
that Eagles offense, man, like I what what do you which part do you want to stop and which part do you want to like let open? Because that opening is just kind of open everywhere. Yeah. That takes us to Baltimore, where the Ravens are hosting the Denver Broncos this week. Ravens at home favored by eight and a half points over under 39 and a half. Absolute lock on the under. The Broncos probably won't score a single point because they suck. Latavius Murray can be startable, but we already talked about the whole situation with Boone back. And the Ravens only allow 82 yards a game on the ground. So that makes it an interesting uh, situation, despite him being RB1, despite maybe him getting 18 to 20 touches. Uh, Cortland Sutton. I mean, again, if you're really needing to start somebody, he's the only guy that's getting volume or the targets. Um, so you could start him. Dolchich, I think we're officially off that train, so we need to wait to see if this is, you know. That, I'm, this I'm is unfortunately still on that train because there's no other options. So that's uh... Yeah, I mean, that's unfortunate because, yeah, we have not seen the volume for him the last couple of weeks. He hasn't been utilized in this offense the way we expected him to and how he kind of showed flashes but the offense just doesn't click on all cylinders consistently that you should ever even you know you should always try to avoid starting broncos offensive players is basically kind of what's been uh the moral of this year uh denver defense though other story they've been good they've been good against every fantasy position second against quarterbacks 10th against running backs second against wide receivers and 13th against tight ends so uh this is a interesting matchup where the ravens will probably use a lot of justin tucker they'll probably move the ball a little bit justin tucker will kick a lot of 50 yarders uh and the final score will probably be like 16 to 0 you know for justin tucker field goals or something like that so i'm expecting a very very low scoring game um it's you know you're never gonna probably bench lamar jackson so you're gonna start him and you're gonna start mark andrews uh i'm probably not gonna start any of the pass catchers you know fuck them all uh besides mark andrews and then gus edwards i mean i think this that's where we're at right now is gus edwards is the most reliable running back you know, in this backfield, but do you feel good about it? Because would you be surprised if somehow this week, Kenyon Drake runs for 25 times for 150 yards? Yeah. All I heard was 16 points for Justin Tucker. And then I was just, I just, I, my brain stopped working, yeah. but yeah, but that would, that would mean it's four field goals. And that would mean the, they get two safeities because that'd be four oh, the points. Okay. Yeah. yeah you're, you're right. You're right. That could um, happen, which as bad as that Broncos defenses or offenses, don't be, don't be shocked if there's two safeties yeah, on Russell Wilson. That's you're just, absolutely that, right. That'd just be another thing to tick off on the bingo card of the atrocious Denver Broncos of 2022. And I, I read somewhere that Justin Tucker's on pace to have his best fantasy year of all time this year. And that's because Which it doesn't feel like it. It doesn't, doesn't right? Like but it's number one right now. And it's just like, it just gets like those nines that are underwhelming when you see other yeah. people 14s that week. You don't see the other teams' twos that are like yeah. one that week, you yeah. know? And then yeah. Tucker doesn't get those. So, and then the, the fact that they don't have any receivers plays a huge role in all of this. And um, yeah, it's working. Yeah. Tucker, Tucker, big day for Tucker. And then ha Hammer, Hammer under 39 and a half. There's just, I don't see a world where points are going to be scored. Yeah, unless they're the just Ravens not. score 30, 40 points. Unless yeah, which the Broncos defense is respectable yeah. enough that I don't think they'll allow that, you know? so and Lamar Jackson's legs are a little little uh, bruised up too. That's one of my conundrums. I should have asked you guys. Probably my biggest conundrum is Lamar Jackson or Tua this week. And they both are playing against Ooh. really good defense. Ooh. Oof. So. Lamar with hobbly legs and no and no receiver sounds like a disaster <laughs> because you can't throw the ball to anybody and you can't use the one thing that's like the best thing about him which is yeah. his legs. So I mean in that scenario and with how high you are about Tua, I feel like you're starting Tua. I, the, man, fuck. Man, okay. how do you not start Lamar though? That's the thing. That's the thing. Is like the I got rubbed like the right way when I saw the forty points week two. I'm like, fuck yeah, I made a great decision. I'm the yeah. smartest fantasy player ever. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, like you see these mediocre twenty fours and like seventeen and fourteens, and I'm like, and I still started them through the whole process. I've had two on my bench since like week seven, and I've never started them. Just wow, just, just been Lamar and Lamar the whole time. So so we'll see. Yeah, it, th those. I mean, again, it's like it, it's. This, the decision is so bad because you're going to kill yourself or like not, yeah. you're going to kick yourself if he does really well yeah. and you decided to bench him. But now because we've had this immense discussion about the possibility that he could do bad, if you start him, you're like, wow, we literally talked about this entire scenario. He's got no receivers. His legs are hobbled and I still started him over to, you know, so it's like a lose, lose because like, that's one of the worst things. And I don't know if you guys ever feel this way, but like, sometimes I'm like, I wish I hadn't even thought of that scenario because now that i know that scenario is a possibility i've already mulled over the idea that that could happen so why didn't i make that decision you know i'd rather have just been ignorant that's, to that. that's funny that's funny that actually gives me peace because it's like uh, at least i thought of that you know that's how i look at that i'm like yeah. you know what there was a realm where i could have gotten that right i'm <laughs> tap yourself in the back and move on
<laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I, I see it. I can understand that way as well, but no, that's it. I mean, again, I don't think the Broncos are going to score much. And I think the Ravens, they might get into the end zone maybe once, but, or maybe twice, but there will be field goals for yeah. sure. Speaking of field goals, the Browns visit the Texans. Cleveland's favored by seven over unders at 47. The Browns, man, the big, big name of the day, big, uh, big name of the week, probably Deshaun Watson gets his first start in a really, really long time. And, um, you know, I think the only scenario I see where you start Watson um, is if you've already made the playoffs, if you've already secured a playoff berth, or you have an injured quarterback or you don't have a quarterback. I think those are the only two kinds of people that will be starting Watson. Um, I have Watson and I have Herbert, right? If Herbert did bad last week, then I would have probably started Watson this week. But Herbert seems to be on the uptick, so I'm not too worried. But that's it. That's it. As far as if you're mulling over starting Watson, it's only if you've already made the playoffs or if you don't have anything remotely close to that as far as options. Um, the only And the other thing is Chubb. Obviously, Browns are number two in rushing touchdowns, number five in total yards, rushing yards, and six in red zone touchdowns. So you start them and you're playing against the Texans, right? How many times do we got to talk about how bad the Texans are? But, but they're ranked 31st in rush yards. Guess who's 32nd? Or in uh, rush yards allowed. Oh, the Vikings. The Vikings are 32nd. No, no, no. Not in Russia. The Eagles. Fourth best. Oh. oh, Eagles. Are the Eagles no. 32nd? No, they're not that bad. They're a little bit better than that. I don't know. What is it? Any guesses, Shove it? The Seahawks. No, they had like a little mediocre two-month span of doing really good, remember? So that kind of skewed yeah. it. Um, but it's the Packers. That? It's the oh, Packers. Oh, wow. Dead last by three points. It's like 1,400 or something like that, and like 1,403. So uh, they're just – they're worse than the Texans, okay? Wow. They're worse than the Texans in stopping the run. So that's another thing to think about next time you see somebody playing against the Packers. Start their freaking running backs. Um, <clears throat> so there's that from the running back perspective. Just chub all day, every day. Um, and then Amari Cooper. Uh, it's an away game. You know, uh, he's been solid in home games every game. Every home game, he's killed it. He's only done well in one away game all year. Every other away game has been single digit or really, really bad. Um, so this is an away game, but it is the Texans. So, you know, you either go with your juju stuff or you go with numbers and I'm sticking with numbers here. The only problem is he may get like three targets all game because they don't need to throw the ball. They're going to run, 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 run. So, you know, there's a world where Amari Cooper doesn't do well. I just, I'm glad I didn't draft him because I've already been burned by the Cooper, the, um, what's it called? The ghost of Cooper past is very much. <laughs> looming in my brain always so uh yeah so think about that you know it's an away game um and then they just might not need to use them at all so again if you have a palmer start in palmer over cooper um and then donovan people jones in deeper leagues yeah go for it um but again at this point you know those there are better options out there and um, but watson could change everything so if you have him don't drop him yet just kind of hold on to him because again watson we've seen what he's done with the texans he's just 25 points, 26 points, all this kind of crazy stuff. So you need to hold on to Watson receivers if they have any signs of, uh, you know, uh, goodness. Uh, and then Najoku, uh, still no practice today. Um, it's a little iffy. Um, I would think it look for other options in the meantime. Uh, and on the Texans, their offense ranks 31st in points, 32nd in yards, 27th in pass yards, 29th in rush yards, 30th in red zone touchdowns. I want no part of this. Uh, their defense ranks third in passing touchdowns, though. Um, that's because that's because you don't have to throw. You don't have to throw against them. Nobody throws against them. Thirty first in rush yards. We already talked about that. Um, so yeah, if you don't, um, you know, that's it. That's it. And then Pierce would be the other other conversation here to be had. Um, you're going to start him. A lot of people are going to start him. I'm starting him in my other league. You know, and that's because the Browns are also bad in rush in uh, stopping the run. I think they're like fourth. Did I talk about this already? No, I didn't. But they're like mm -hmm. they're in like the top six in bad run stopping. So I think there might be five or six. So they're not that great either. So if the top <laughs> great stat, that's a great stat, by the way, bad run stuffing, <laughs> bad run stuffing. We should have put a little Turkey there put on Thanksgiving. Um, but yeah, so if there's ever a game to get a resurgence for Pierce, it's right now. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of really good matchups, but for some reason I'm very intrigued about this matchup, obviously because of the storyline with Watson. And I think, yeah, like you said, for the Pierce owners who have had, you know, shit shows the past couple weeks, this is a pretty big bounce back opportunity. Awesome. That takes us to the next game. Seahawks at Rams. Seattle is favored by seven points over under at 41. Fantasy wise on the Seahawks side, 
Uh, Geno Smith is going to start for you this week. Uh, Kenneth Walker is second. Um, he had 2.2 yards per carry last two games, uh, and he's playing against the top rush defense in the NFL in the Rams, 3.9 yards per carry and 97.3 yards per game. But you're still going to start your RB1, Kenneth Walker. He gets into the red zone one way or the other, so you'll you'll start him. DK Metcalf last, last week. 15 targets, 11 reception, 90 yards. Um, DK, will he have it his way against Ramsey? Uh, probably. R- R- Ramsey is allowing a passer rating of 125 uh, QB, uh, QBR. So um, Ramsey's just not the same guy as he was. And I think that uh, DK should be able to come up top uh, against Ramsey. And I feel like the Rams are probably just getting, in, you know, just packing up for, for next season. Um, you're also going to start Tyler Lockett. Uh, that duo, Metcalf and Lockett, have been uh, producing numbers, getting you touchdowns, yards, so you're going to continue starting them. Uh, and on the Rams side, Cam Akers did not practice on Thursday. So Kyron Williams, he could be the guy that gets the RB1 responsibilities. If Cam Akers isn't playing, you you want to start Kyron Williams. They don't have anyone else. And uh, Van Jefferson, he's a wide receiver one, but that doesn't mean anything. Uh, and you're not going to start Tyler Higby. So the only person that I'm starting for the Rams is Kyron Williams if Cam, Cam Akers doesn't play. Uh, the game script is going to be based. Bryce Perkins will get the start again. Stafford uh, most likely will not start uh, as according to Sean McVay, the head coach. Um, and uh, they have a tough ma- The Rams have a tough matchup against the Seahawks with the fourth highest scoring offense with 26 and a half points for, per game. How do you beat the Seahawks? Well, you do what the Vegas Raiders did last week. Ran 40 times for 283 yards, which could mean Kyron Williams' season. The Seahawks are giving up 150 yards a game. So, you know, this is... You have to have an offensive line to run the ball. You got to have an offensive line. Dude, you know, it's so funny. You know what, what thought ran into my head when you said... And then on the Ram side, I had the Rock interrupting people saying it doesn't matter and i just wanted to scream that because nothing about the rams team from a fantasy perspective should matter if you're so desperate that you're starting kyron williams fine but please just don't like just don't do it there's this team plays for nothing right they're playing it's like starting it like they have nothing to play for they're starting bryce fucking perkins guys like we're watching a guy who probably doesn't even belong in the xfl like he's horrible he's like a receiver play it's like joe webb it's like joe webb getting consecutive starts at quarterback like what the fuck that is a joke that is a joke so, like there's just nothing there i i think kyron williams will give you like eight eight and a half to ceiling 10 points uh, and that's if he gets like passes thrown to him like eight times this game uh and that's what you're banking on if you're starting kyron williams, you're not banking on 89 rushes on 11 sorry 89 yards on 11 rushes it's just not gonna happen but you know if you get those eight targets and it's half point ppr then you muster out like you know, 55 yards on eight catches. Yeah. Flex. Man, yeah. I wish I had Kyron Williams. In the beginning of this uh, week, uh, Najee Harris, questionable. Leonard Fournette, questionable. If I if I had Kyron Williams, I would not be sweating as much as I am today. Show, show of its handcuffing decisions this season, questionable. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of questionables here. That The fact that you had to be like, if I had Kyron Williams, I'd be ecstatic. Yeah. rewind to the entire season to all of the chain of events that led you to this specific <laughs> moment <laughs> oh, oh man what do you do now yeah. you gotta make the best of it now you know yeah you do you do you do dude a lot of good matchups but this might be the game of the week i'm glad we talked a lot about it earlier because i feel like we could spend like 20 minutes talking about it dolphins at 49ers this week in san francisco favored by four and a half over under 46 and a half uh uh, this is just uh, everything game script. Everything is a match made in heaven. This offense of the Miami dolphins that cannot be stopped against this defense of the 49ers. that's finally getting healthy Shanahan versus McDaniel to as tough as probably matchup to date, right? I mean, he's going up against uh, the number one pass defense in the NFL with his left tackle seemingly not going to play, which we saw a dramatic difference in this quick throw scheme last week when they had to basically bench him for Skylar Thompson, which I read more about. And I think they benched him also, with the idea that Armstead was hurt. So like the, the, the drive that Armstead got hurt, like the next drive or the next two consecutive drives to what did not have very much time to throw. So he got hit a couple times and they were up 30, nothing. And so he was like, whatever, we'll bench him. So I think that played a role into that. And I think that could play a big role in this matchup. Right. So, um, but the, but the big thing is 
we know how smart, and we've talked, and shashod has been on this train about Mike McDaniel and him being really smart. So he's got to understand that that's probably a reality for them this Sunday, which means he's probably game planning around the fact that he's not going to be with his uh, star left tackle. So I think that's a huge storyline there. Obviously, uh, with all that being said, Points are going to need to be had for Miami side because their defense can't stop anybody. So San Francisco has a really good opportunity to control the clock, run the football, uh, basically get everything they want on offense because Miami's defense has just been that bad as well, which means Miami, if they have to play from behind, they have the weapons and the ability to do that. So the being behind could lead to those fantasy points that, you know, on the surface, it feels like it's a tough matchup for, for the Dolphins side, right? Because of the defense of San Francisco. So I think Tua, Wilson, Hill, Waddle, you're all start, you're starting all of them. And for the San Francisco side, whichever running back ends up being healthy, which uh, there were rumblings of Tevin Coleman sighting. And, you know, Tevin Coleman to the 49ers is like, um, the equivalent of another team that is obsessed with a running back that, you know, just doesn't really make any sense. So he's like the practice squad guy that, you know, their top two guys are hurt. Mitchell's hurt. CMC's uh, hobbly. I think before they go to Jordan Mason or before they go to that, uh, whatever mm-hmm. Davis price, they're going to go to Tevin Coleman because he's reliable. He's a veteran. They trust him. So, uh, that's a really random thing to keep in mind. Debo and Ayuk points are going to be had points are going to be had. The Dolphins defense sucks. So I think, Miami, I think uh, the 49ers are going to put up a lot of points early, and I think the Dolphins are going to have to come from behind. So I think points are going to be had from a fantasy perspective for both sides, but I don't think it's going to come as easy to Miami because, again, that 49ers defense man, Teron Armstead, is going to be the, uh, the, the deciding factor in the way this game goes, in my opinion. Damn, yeah, that's something to keep track of for sure. Now I don't, I don't want to start Tua then. Fuck, if that's, <laughs> if that's a legit reason he was bad. Yeah. And yeah. this is Nick freaking <laughs> Bosa. They, they, I mean, again, it's after the fact, right? So they can use that as one of the reasons now because it adds, it fuels the narrative, it makes sense that narrative. So I don't know if it's just kind of a scapegoat, but they did mention that that factored into it. So I don't yeah, know. Yeah, no, I'm going to be all over Dolphins Twitter for the rest of the week. I'm going to be going deep inside the world of Dolphins world and figuring out why they did that exactly and what's going to happen this summer. Show it's going to be in the Atlantic swimming with actual dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> Dolphin troop. Um, all right, well... Here we are. It's the world of the Chiefs again, and I get to have the blessing of talking about my beloved second favorite team, the Chiefs. <laughs> uh, the Chiefs <laughs> go to visit the Bengals for a repeat of the NFL playoffs last year. Kansas City's favored by two at Bengals. Over under is at 50 freaking three. Um, well, you know, from the Chiefs angle, there's really not much to be said. You guys probably like it's the same story every week. Uh, except Mahomes is having a little revenge game, right? He got destroyed by um, – uh, not really destroyed, but the second half resurgence of the Bengals is something that none of us Insanity. have ever seen before. Insanity. And uh, took him by surprise. So I'm assuming that they're going to try to kind of take a you know stronghold of this game early and not let that happen again. Uh, the running back conundrum is the really only thing you need to be kind of put, keeping an eye on. Pacheco's definitely the every down back at this point. Um, he got about what uh, – <clears throat> like 22 plus touches last week, 23 touches, 22 rushes and one catch. And that one catch went for 17 yards. And, um, you know, if if you're getting 22 plus touches in a uh, Kansas City offense, you're not worried about that player, right? You're you're going to, you're not, you're just going to start that player and not worried about it. But the problem here was before was the the CEH thing. And then the Jarek McKinnon thing, Jarek McKinnon's hurt. He may play, he may not play. Uh, CH just sucks. They've they've understood this now, but CH is now coming back from injured reserve. Uh, I believe sometime soon, or maybe now, I forget. Um, so there they may be there may be some eating up of uh, Pacheco's touches soon, but not this game. This game is going to be one of the games where hopefully he kind of just bursts out, and um, then he's like, okay, everybody else, stop it. I'll just I'll just do it, take it from here. Um, and then after Pacheco, it's McKinnon versus Rojo versus Melvin Gordon, right? Uh, Rojo's there's there's some talk about Rojo doing some Rojo things coming out of nowhere this week so we'll see if that ends up happening I wouldn't really make that a stash point at this point because Pacheco's not playing bad and I don't see him losing touches drastically to Rojo who's been backing up most yeah. of his career at this point yeah. um and then the wide receivers right it's Kelsey then it's Juju then it's MVS then it's Sky Moore then it's Watson and then there's everyone else and injured Tony so that's the pecking order whether you like it or not that's just how it's going to be and um, I, I don't see this. This is going to waver between the MVS and the Sky Moors. 
Uh, Watson's going to be on the lower end for sure. Kelsey's going to be on the top end for sure. Juju's going to be next after Kelsey in case Kelsey needs a breather. He's going to run the exact same route for him and get huge yards for him. But the confusion here is between MVS and Sky Moore. That's like where the biggest closeness is in this uh, matchup. So if you want to grab one of them hoping for something, I don't blame you. But, you know, it's pretty established here. I I wouldn't really dabble too much into this. There's other places where you can get more points from a player like a a Zay Jones. Uh, rather than dealing with MVS versus Sky Moore. So it's as entertaining as, as it is, the number one offense in the league with the number one amount of touchdowns and the number one yards, um, it, it's too spread out. It's too spread. It's too top-heavy with Kelsey, and then it's just way too spread out. So you don't want any part of that at this point, at least, until someone does something uh, drastically. Um, on the Bengals' end, you know, Chase is coming back. What does that mean? It's good for Burrow. It's bad for everybody else. It's just going to be drastically bad for everybody else. Um, Burrow, you know, he's going to have a big day. He's going to have to keep up with Patrick Mahomes. And I think, um, you know, he's probably going to have one of the better days of all the quarterbacks this week. Uh, Mixon, you know, looks like he's coming back. There's a very slim, slim, slim chance P. Ryan gets to play this week. So if you got to use fab points for him, don't. Just don't. Um, If you don't get him, my bad. But um, if you do get him, it's you're gonna thank me because it's just not worth it at this point. He's already back practicing, and it's a concussion. It's not like an injury, injury. So he'll be fine unless he gets concussed again. Then my bad, again. Um, which has happened. Which has been happening. Yeah, it happens a lot. It happens all the time, actually, and it's happening a lot in the NFL lately. Yeah. Yeah, um, and then Chase versus Chase and Higgins. I really want to talk about this because. You know, in m- most offenses, when there's a clear cut wide receiver one, you would expect, you know, teams to kind of double up the wide receiver one and open things up for the wide receiver two. But that's not that's not what actually happens. They just force feed the wide receiver one because he's that good. Look at Justin Jefferson. Look at Tyree Kill. Um, Tyree Kill is a little bit different situation because he gets his plus someone else gets theirs. Right. So this right here, this situation is closer to the Tyree Kill situation than it is to all the other situations. Right. Um, like there's Mike, uh, Mike Evans and Keenan Allen can make an argument, but look at Devonta Adams and somebody else. There's a clear difference. Look at Hopkins and somebody else. There's still a pretty clear difference, even though what, um, uh, Hollywood Brown did that one game. I don't expect that to be happening often. So what I'm trying to get at is Higgins is one of the few players that'll still benefit the same, or if not more having chase back. So Higgins owners, you should be pretty excited that this is happening. Um, although the targets may drop, the chances of scoring bigger plays may still be there. Um, are we sold? Are we sold on the fact that Chase is coming back a hundred percent? I don't think I don't know about hundred percent, but I think there's a hundred percent chance he is coming back, though. Okay, so yeah. you you guys, if you guys had Jamar Chase this week, you're automatically starting and putting putting him back in your lineups. <sighs> Because yeah. you know why I asked that? Because I'm so dumb. I we had that whole Pickens Palmer conversation. That's I forgot my IR my IR spot is occupied by Jamar Chase. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. I, I well, I don't know why. I, I when I did my um, research over the last couple of days, everything's leaning towards Chase playing. I didn't get like a like you know like an inner uh, thing that told me like okay, don't want to even worry about this guy. He's not playing. Like I I dived into the world of the Chase playing a factor. Um, so he was a participant in Thursday's practice today, limited participants. That's five consecutive sessions he's uh, he's participated in, but he hasn't had a full practice. But then again, players like this, you don't really need a full practice. Um, so we will see. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's the thing, right? My fear is that he plays, but he is limited in what he does just because again, it's his first week back. So I just don't know if that factors into it, but it is the Chiefs, So it's like, it's almost that's like you kind of have to try hard, you know, I don't know. All right, from one good game to another good game, Los Angeles Chargers are going to charge on the way to Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, over under is at 51 and a half, and even money, the, no one is really favored in this game. Uh, Fantasy-wise, Chargers, you're going to start Justin Herbert. I expect a big game for Justin Herbert. Austin Eckler, who's been getting targets after targets after targets. This is crazy, and, uh, and he's still going to start him. Give Apple. some to somebody else, man. God, give some to the receivers, Eckler. God, it's so... I bet having Eckler is the best thing in the world because I've never had him, and I'm yeah. just and when you don't have Eckler and you have somebody else in that offense, it's so fucking annoying because everything just goes to Eckler. Yeah, and anyone else just gets a- injured that you would yeah. think about yeah. having. Like Keenan Allen uh, had been injured, but he's back, and he's probably going to start doing Keenan Allen things here uh, in the latter half of the season. Uh, Mike Williams, limited practice practice seems unlikely to play. Even if he's going to play, I would stay away from him. We've seen what happens when Mike Williams comes in and ends up getting hurt again, or he's on a pitch count. Uh, and if Mike Williams, uh, well, even if Mike Williams is there or not, Joshua Palmer is the 
probably going to be the wide receiver too. So he is a streamable start for you. Probably the last week that you can you can do that. And then Gerald Everett, uh, tight end is thin. So Gerald Everett could be a guy that you uh, start or continue to start if you have him on your team. Doubt you have anyone else. On the Raiders side, Derek Carr is also streamable against this Chargers um, pass defense. Josh uh, Joshua Jacobs, he's the NFL rushing leader. Definitely start him. Devontae Adams, Foster Moreau. Chargers are allowing the 12th highest fantasy points to tight ends. So Foster Moreau is definitely a uh, solid start for you um, this week. So the game script, this team, th- these two teams are very, very interesting. And the fact that the Chargers... Um, run defense is very poor, which plays to the Raiders' strength, which is their rush offense. The Raiders' pass defense is really poor, which plays to the Chargers' um, strength in their offense, which is passing the ball. The Raiders, uh, Chargers give up 5.6 yards per carry allowed to running backs, which is 32nd as far as that stats in terms of yards per carry goes. And then the Raiders' pass defense ha- is giving up the highest QBR rate, 103.2 and a completion percentage of um, just dead last in completion percentage to receivers. So all that being said, I mean, the line just makes sense. The over at 15 15 and a half just makes sense for me as well. This is probably going to boil down to which team, which defense gets to their quarterbacks and sacks the quarterbacks in a timely manner in those third down uh, when when they have to move the chains. That's what it's going to boil down to. They may even go to overtime. I don't know. Um, But a lot of fantasy points to be had here should be a solid, solid, uh, fun affair in the uh, later half, latter half of the football on Sunday. A nice little rematch of that, you know, playoff implication game. Yeah. I think That's last year, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was I mean, a wild one. Where there was a huge fire and show its uh, balcony. Man, that oh, was... that was then. Yeah, I remember we were watching from outside. You were inside, all stressed out because Mike uh, Williams wasn't doing shit. Oh, uh, I don't remember that. I don't remember oh, the fire. Yeah, we were cooking outside. Oh, okay, okay. Mexican. Oh, yeah, yeah. It wasn't that big. It was a fire from the meat, but that was the week that uh, the Raiders. No, the Chargers. I do happen. remember now. I was thinking your new place and not your old place. I remember now. I remember now. We had the thing on the stairs. Okay, it all makes it's all coming back to me. It's all coming back to me. Yeah, the Chargers <laughs> missed the playoffs, allowed the Steelers to make it to the playoffs. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. Sunday night football is at Jerry's World this week. Colts in town. Dallas favored by 10 and a half, over under 43 and a half. Colts can't score the football. They're averaging 15.8 points per game, but the Cowboys do give up 131.9 yards per game on the ground. So if they're going to have any fighting chance, if they're going to somehow try to keep this game close or even cover the spread for that matter, Jonathan Taylor has to control the game by running, moving the chains in time of possession. The the offensive line is just not going to be able to contain this pass rush. We've already seen how bad they are against mediocre teams. Matt Ryan's constantly on the ground, constantly running for his life. So uh, against Dallas, I expect a lot more of that. So again, They're going to have to try to pass as little as possible, run as much as possible, build off of that with play action. Jonathan Taylor, you start. We talked about Michael or Michael Pittman Jr. in that situation. Uh, Jelani Woods, weird blow up game last week, but I think he's on the injury report. So uh, I don't really know what you do with that there. Colts defense is kind of middle of the pack. They're not really bad, but also not really good. Middle of the pack against quarterbacks, running backs, but First against opposing receivers and 18th against tight ends. So CD Lamb is the only guy that just weirdly that matchup, you know, may not play out and you may not end up with the points that you expect to get from a receiver like CD Lamb. But from other guys, Cowboys defense must start Dak, Zeke, Pollard, and Dalton Schultz. Um, I'm expecting again Matt Ryan running for his life a lot. The only way that can't happen is if Jonathan Taylor somehow is blowing up this run defense for like five yards a game. But other than that, dude, there's just no way. This pass rush is way too scary that Colts offensive line can't protect. So uh, the writing's on the wall in this one, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I'm really intrigued to see what, how Dak performs the rest of the season because uh, well, since he's come back, well, before he was here, before he came back, the Cowboys were like 26th in passing offense or like 25th in rushing and all this stuff. And now they're number one in like every offensive category since Dak Prescott's come back. So um, I'm really intrigued to see how the rest of the season goes for them. Yeah, they've been clicking. So Monday night football, my second favorite night of football. The Saints go visit the Buccaneers. Tampa Bay is favored by three and a half. Over under is at 40 and a half. Um, so I'll just, I'll just make this clear for you. Saints defense sucks. Saints defense is bad. However, Saints defense has had Tampa Bay's uh, number pretty much – most of the latter half of Tom Brady's career. 
And um, the Saints are fifth, however, in offensive yards on offense, seventh in passing yards, sixth in passing touchdowns, and 16th in rushing yards. So they're definitely, their game plan is to throw the ball mostly. But the Buccaneers defense is fourth in pass yards allowed. So no, no fly zone. And um, 19th in rush yards. So, you know, the, 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 the medium here where things can be given is rush running the ball, right? So Kamara may, may not have a better day than last week. Um, you know, uh, I just don't think it's been the same Buccaneers defense from a rushing perspective. So it's I mentioned not. it's not right. Like I mentioned, you know, uh, there's some of their key players on the passing end have been gone. However, they're still doing pretty good. You know, fourth and passing yards allowed is not it's definitely still elite level of shutting down on the passing game. So they are only going to get better with uh, Winfield, our beloved Vikings, greatest tackling cornerback of all time. Uh, his son comes back and um, they're just become better at that. So I assume I'm assuming the, the Saints are going to have to try to run this ball. OK, um, and in order to do that, Kamara has to do well. Uh, Olave, we talked about this earlier. We were debating this and, you know, it's, it's just a matter of comparison. It's about rankings and Olave is strictly going to be in like the 14, 15, 16, 17 range for a lot of people this week. And as far as top wide receivers go, um, so he's still going to be started in the majority of fantasy leagues. Um, and then, you know, Buccaneers historically are bad against tight ends, and especially this year, they're last against tight ends. Um, so Taysom Hill? I don't think so. He's not a tight end. Okay? <laughs> He's a quarterback slash running back slash punt returner slash or punt block man or whatever you want to call it. But he's not a tight end. So don't fall for that because ESPN, Yahoo, they all have labeled him as tight end. And a lot of people are seeing that green. They're like, oh, my God, 30 second. Oh, my God, put him on the roster. Yeah, that's where you don't look at that ESPN shit and you come on the only playbook and we set it straight for you because don't fall for that shit, okay? Unless Taysom goes off this week somehow, then my bad again. Three touchdowns. Yeah, you know, whatever. It could happen. But just just clearing the air for you. He's not a tight end. So don't look at that. That's what they're going off of. So don't look at that. But that does mean Jawan Johnson, who has scored a touchdown in like four of his last five games or something crazy like that, um, hit, like statistically is on pace to score another touchdown. Okay? So um, that is a good pickup for you if you want to go with numbers and if, if you're an analytic guy. I, I can't see a better scenario right there. For a tight end this week, for an easy pickup start tight end, I really don't see a better scenario. Um, on the Buccaneers side, okay, Brady gets murdered by the Saints as of late all the time. Is it the same story here? Possibly. Um, but this year, Saints are 32nd in interceptions. They don't know how to pick the ball, okay? Their secondary does not know how to catch the ball. So it's got a bunch of Deontay Johnsons back there. Huh? <laughs> Yikes. <What>? Yikes. <laughs> Damn, came out of nowhere. That's a left field jab. Um, that's like that's like when you got like an opponent on the ropes and then like rookie she starts running down the side and like like just does some weird choke while the ref's not watching and that's kind of what that felt like. Um, but regardless, um, Saints cannot catch the ball um, from a secondary perspective, so maybe starting Brady isn't the end of the world. Um, however, here is the biggest stat of the day for everybody: Saints pass defense is ranked number one since week seven, numero uno, and that's not including. Uh, interceptions or anything like that. It's just allowing yardage. So they've they've actually been doing much better. Um, their rush defense absolutely bad, absolutely atrocious. But the pass defense has gotten better halfway through the season. Um, White versus Fournette is a conversation that we've talked about already. Fournette is trending towards being healthy. So you know, and then the Saints are in the top thirty three percent in pass defense. Uh, using all the data for the whole year. But like I said, as of late, they're closer to the top 5%. Um, so that means the Buccaneers are probably going to run this ball like a lot. There's going to be a lot of running here. So, But the, the question is who's running the ball? And we don't know. I just don't see a world where Fournette gets a huge amount of carries, but there could be a world where White gets a lot of carries. So, you know, make your pick your poison there. Um, and uh, to put it in a statistical terms, uh, they are number one in pass defense since week seven, but they're, no, they're number 25th in rush yards allowed um, all season long. So there's still, you know, points to be had on the ground for the Buccaneers. Um, yeah. And then other players on the Buccaneers to talk about Godwin, I think has taken over the number one wide receiver role. And it's pretty evident why it's because Tom Brady doesn't have time to throw. And that's because they're, they're, they've, they're missing like three offensive linemen from last year. Uh, one of them recently just got hurt all pro uh, right tackle. So that means he's going to have even less more time, less time to throw. So uh, that just opens up more room for Godwin. You know, he's like a tight end, but faster than a tight end and lengthier than a, uh, uh, quicker than a tight end and better hands than a tight end. So it's a fantastic play moving forward. 
Uh, Evans, you're probably wondering why are, why is Evans points not good? You know, Evans that's why, bro. That's why there's not time for Tom Brady to throw. Evans banks on the deep bomb, sixty yard catches, forty yard slants, all this crazy shit, deep deep stuff, and there's just not enough time for Tom Brady to do all that. Um, so that 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 makes um, you know it's the short game very interesting, and Godwin is probably one of the best short game players in the game. Um, also, not to mention, Evans is probably going to get kicked out by the end of the second quarter because it's Lattimore, and they're going to get into a fight, and then something's going to happen. So um, just be careful with if you're, if you're an Evans owner, be absolutely careful, unless they want to make you know a statement on Lattimore and he wants a, like a lob in the end zone, which could also very well happen. Um, and then the tight end situation, man, I, I'm, I, I'm, I want no part of this. I know we've debated like Bray to this guy, that guy, this, this dude, that dude. Yeah, I mentioned the short game is better. You know, dump offs are better. So that is the one thing you can take away from this and still risk it and start somebody. Um, but there's better options. I know, I know, I know tight ends are limited and whatnot, but there's Juwan Johnson's just hanging out there for you to come go grab it. You know, players that have good matchups. Uh, Gerald Everett has been dropped by some people because of the injury. He's hovering around in probably like 40, 50% of leagues. Um, so yeah, go grab those guys. Don't stress out over which tight end Tom Brady likes. Um, cause you know, it, it could, it could go any way. And especially now that Braid is healthier, it's even harder to decide what's going to happen. So, um, yeah. Yeah. It's a good way to end off the week slate of games. That's the rundown. A lot of, a lot of good matchups. I feel like there were like two, three weeks in a row where we were getting like one matchup where two teams were above 500 or something like that. It was super yeah. wild. And now this week, it seems like every game Dude, has some sort of playoff game. implication. Every game besides yeah. Colts. I mean, that's probably a pl- playoff implication too, but yeah, I'm like a really good game perspective. Every game, every yeah. game, there's, there's like rivalry or something besides the Colts and Packers. There's something to be said about all of these games. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. With that being said, all three of us are going to give you guys our one matchup of the week. I will start us off. No explanation needed, in my opinion. If you listen to the only playbook, you understand that if you're playing against the Houston Texans, you are going to deploy your running back. And Nick Chubb this week has the pleasure of playing against his Houston run defense. And he does get Deshaun Watson back, which means, you know, the Texans have to account for the fact that Deshaun Watson could keep that football and throw it deep. He could keep that football and scramble as well. So it just means that there is no way this Houston defense is going to be able to contain Nick Chubb. Nick Chubb is my matchup of the week. Yeah, absolutely smash there. Smash that stuff. Um, my matchup of the week, I'm going quarterback this week. Uh, Joe Burrow. I just don't see a world where Joe Burrow has a bad game. It's just, there is no world. You know, you can, you can do the whole um, Benedict Cumberbatch thing and just look at all the possibilities and all that stuff. And there is no possibility here. There's nothing about the chiefs defense. That's like, Oh my God, they're so stout on the passing end. Like they just haven't been. And um, Bengals offense is too good. And um, that just means someone's going to score points and it's going to come from the hands of Burrow. Unless somebody rushes the ball for four times or something, you know, uh, but just Burrow likes to throw the ball too much. He's got too many good receivers. Chase is coming back. Possibly Burrow's going to have a great day. Awesome. I like how you said Benedict Cumberbatch and not Dr. Strange as if like Benedict Cumberbatch is the person that like in real life has all <laughs> possibility of yeah. outcomes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so my matchup of the week is going to be from the Raiders and Chargers game. And I think honestly, anyone that is on that field is going to be, has an amazing matchup uh, fantasy wise, but Justin Herbert is the one I'm going to go with. He is playing against the Raiders uh, defense, which I mentioned, you know, 32nd in the NFL, as far as completion percentage, highest rate QBR allowed. Uh, and so I, I think that with Keenan Allen coming back, uh, they have, they've got enough weapons for Justin Herbert to have a solid day um in uh yeah this week so justin herbert yeah if you guys are playing or you, if you're playing against one of those three guys or if you have one of those three guys expect big big fantasy numbers that's it for match of the week and that is it for the episode do you guys have anything else for me yeah i'd like to talk about integrity in sports all right and what I mean by that is, you know, it, there's a lot of betting going on nowadays. And, you know, you start, you know, it's, it's like a, there's a huge uprising in like DraftKings and FanDuel. So we all like to like put a little bet in or like make friendly bets with each other, you know, if, as friends, you know, oh, this guy's going to do better. What do you think? This guy's going to do worse. Well, let's bet on it. You know, so that's what I did with my friend Paul Bozak a couple of days ago. I told him that Rashad White was going to score over six and a half fantasy points. And he's like, no. And then uh, he he said Najee Harris was going to score more than 15 fantasy points. And I was like, probably not. And we're like, let's bet on it. $5 for each of those, $10, right? We bet on it. 
Guess what happened? Najee Harris wasn't doing that well. He rumbled in the end zone, but at halftime, he had like 10 carries for 30 yards or something. Really bad. Um, so there was a chance where he wouldn't got that 15. Uh, he got hurt, right? Sorry. He got hurt. So he didn't get the 15 points. Rashard White got the over six and a half. So that means I won the bet. And I'm like, what's up, Paul? How you doing? Where's my money? And he's like, well, it doesn't count, man. It doesn't count because uh, he got hurt. And I'm like, in what world do you live where players getting hurt after placing a bet gives you like, oh, sorry, man. Your, your boy got hurt. Your boy got hurt. I'm going to give you your money back. In what I'm world does that happen? Pay- I'm assuming he... I'm assuming you're saying this on our podcast because he will listen to this. Oh, so, yeah. Paul, oh, yeah. fantasy football. Do, do the fantasy football world give you a pass when you start a player and they get hurt? In what world? Do, are they like, you know what? We're just going to add the projected points for you for the week because they got hurt mid-game. We're so sorry. Do they do that? Uh, is this one of the worst takes I've ever heard a oh, it's- player or fan ever make? Is this the wussiest take I've ever heard? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Pay up, man. It's time to pay up. Pay up. Pay up, bro. People said it. I'm going to make a poll. This is going to be a poll. Pay up or don't pay up. Pay up or we're going to be like Stewie on Family Guy (laughs) showing up with the fucking bat for $10. (laughs) For $10. Uh, Yeah, that's awful. That's awful. Injuries, yeah. Yeah. Stupid. stupid, It's about the integrity. It's about the principle. You can keep the money, actually. Just It's about the principle. Yeah, it's about the principle. Exactly. Uh, that's it. That's it, guys. That's it for the episode. Thank you guys so much. Again, another really, really long one in the wind. Uh, a lot of action that is going to be had at literally less than an hour from now as Thursday Night Football kicks off. Hope you guys enjoy your wonderful weekend. Win your fantasy matchups. Uh, your favorite team wins, and you win a lot of money. I'm Sweetheart. That's your show. That's your show. That's your show. That's your show.